Hello everyone, I'm Marcel Vanderweer, editor of OHS Canada. Thank you for joining us today for this important session. Today's webinar, Confined Space Safety, will explain how to help keep workers safe from hazards associated with confined spaces. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the GoToWebinar interface at the right of the screen and we'll do our best to ask it at the end of the presentation. With that, I'd like to introduce David McPherson. He is an application engineering specialist with 3M Canada in London, Ontario. Over to you, Dave. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we very much appreciate you taking the time to join us today. In today's presentation, uh, we will explore confined spaces, respiratory hazards that occur in confined spaces, and respirators that are commonly used for confined space entry. Now, this presentation is based primarily on Canadian and American content. Requirements may vary by jurisdiction, but always consult the user instructions for the product that you're using and follow local laws and regulations. This presentation contains an overview of general information and should not be relied upon to make specific decisions. Completing this program does not certify proficiency in safety and health. Information is current as of the date listed for the presentation and requirements can change in the future. This presentation should not be re relied upon in isolation as the content is often accompanied by additional and or clarifying information or discussion. 3M owns all rights in the presentation. Digital recording or other reproduction is strictly prohibited without permission. And application images may include products that have undergone engineering changes since photos were taken or may not be compliant with your local rules and regulations. So that, that's the legal part. Now we'll get into the content. So what is a confined space? You can find many definitions in various laws, provincial guidelines, and standards such as NFPA 350. But the good news is they all have a common theme. Confined spaces are partially or fully enclosed spaces that are not designed or constructed for continuous human occupancy and have restricted means of access or egress and may become hazardous. And we'll talk more about that shortly. These pictures show examples of more obvious confined spaces. The images on the left are storage tanks. The center pictures are chemical reaction vessels. The top right is an alkylation unit at a refinery. And the bottom right is an entrance to a sewer or utility hole. Less obvious examples may include chemical treatment pools, ventilation ductwork, ovens, tunnels, and some compartments in ships. What is entry? Well, it's important to understand that confined space entry does not only refer, sorry, does not only refer to when a person completely enters a confined space. Confined space entry takes place whenever any part of the body intentionally breaks the plane of the entrance. Why go in? Well, common reasons are to inspect interior surfaces looking for wear or corrosion, cleaning, such as in the case of a storage vessel, it may be used for different materials and cleaning may be undertaken to prevent any residue from contaminating the next material to be stored. You might go in for repair. That might include activities like welding. You may go in for construction if there's a need to change the space for the way it's used. And of course, you may have to go in for rescue. Entries may be conducted by employees, contractors, or emergency services. So we know what they are and why we go in, but what are the hazards? Again, there are many different hazards that can be found in confined spaces, and they can be grouped into a few categories. The number of categories, and the scope of those categories may vary somewhat based on the laws, guidelines, or standards that you reference. 
For example, some may choose to separate physical hazards, such as noise and vibration, from mechanical hazards, which are based, which can include stored en energy, such as the potential to be crushed or burned. But again, they all have a common intent. So in a broad sense, physical hazards may include anything from the potential for engulfment to noise to extreme temperatures. Atmospheric hazards may include lack of oxygen or buildup of a toxic gas. Configuration hazards may include a restricted point of entry and egress due to its size or position. It could include low ceilings, narrow spaces, or maze-like configurations. Biological hazards may include the presence of microorganisms, such as bacteria, viruses, or fungi, which may be present on their own or through insects and rodents. Environmental hazards can be combined with physical hazards and can include things like the potential for drowning due to flooding. Some references will also refer to human factors. And you may be wondering, which laws apply to confined space entry and, and who enforces those laws? Well, some industries do fall under federal jurisdiction if they are an industry that's deemed to be of national concern, such as uranium mining or interprovincial transportation. However, health and safety is most commonly regulated at the provincial and territorial levels. Confined space entry is regulated by the same agencies that address occupational health and safety. Standards such as CSA Z1006 or NFPA 350 are often re referenced as best practices. These standards are not legislation, of course, but they may be re referred to directly in law or they may be utilized through application of a general duty clause. All of these laws and standards have a similar intent, which is to anticipate, recognize, evaluate, and control the hazards of confined space entry. Atmospheric hazards can be grouped into two broad categories that express the type and the degree of risk. Atmospheres that are not immediately dangerous to life or health, or IDLH, are those in which all contaminants are known, the exposure concentration is known, concentrations are below their IDLH level, and there is adequate oxygen, that is, oxygen levels are above 19.5%. It's common to know what is in the confined space, but it can be more difficult to know how much is present and thereby determine the, the degree of hazard. And that brings us to the next category. Atmospheres are considered ideal H if the contaminant or its concentration are unknown or concentrations are known to exceed the ideal H concentration for that chemical or if there's inadequate oxygen. We'll come back to atmospheric hazards after talking briefly about confined space configuration and operations that indicate level of risk. This is an example of a low risk entry because the entry is shallow. There's good natural ventilation and if required, mechanical ventilation would be easy to use. Also, there is minimal risk of flooding or entrapment. That does not mean there is no risk. A hazardous condition might develop if a heavy gas were to float into the trench and accumulate, or if that pipe were to leak. Under these conditions, a worker might suddenly pass out and fall down and then be trapped or remain in the hazardous atmosphere. Even in this simple example, atmospheric testing remains an important control. This is an example of a medium risk entry in which the air is tested and determined to be safe, the worker is attached to a retrieval system, and the route of egress is unobstructed. Note that the space is being continuously tested, and the worker has an emergency escape breathing device, or EEBD, with them. These are units that provide five to 15 minutes of clean air to breathe during an escape in the event that a toxic environment were to suddenly develop. This entry is also medium risk, but with greater risk than the last example. This might take place on a sewer, utility service way, or a subway tunnel. One reason there is more risk is because the workers are disconnecting from the fall arrest and retrieval system. In the event of an emergency, it might take longer to get out. 
You can see that the atmosphere is continuously tested and believed to be safe. But again, an EEBD is being carried in case the testing equipment were to suddenly indicate a problem. High-risk scenarios may include non-standard entries or involve non-standard procedures or have the potential to produce unknown concentrations of airborne contaminants. This might take place if someone were to enter a space to conduct cleaning and they disturbed accumulated residue of an unknown material. It requires use of specific procedures and equipment. For example, if an atmosphere is considered to be potentially ideal H or might become ideal H, then the worker must wear a multifunctional respirator, such as the 3M Scott Scape Pack, or a self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBA, such as the 3M Scott Air Pack 75I. It would also require the presence of a rescue team who's equipped and trained to use these same forms of respiratory protection. Well, we've talked about what confined spaces are and why people enter them, the types of hazards that may be present and reviewed hazard levels. We can all appreciate the need for good confined space management and controls. This is reinforced by the fact that workers continue to be injured or die when confined space entry is not properly managed. There's limited data available, but we do know that the US Occupational Safety and Health Administration reported that 96 deaths occurred in the United States between 2005 and 2009, so approximately 20 per year. We also know WorkSafe BC reported 18 deaths over a 15 year period, so on average, a little more than one. Sixty-one percent of the time, these deaths occur from physical hazards, such as engulfment, falling, or electrocution. Thirty-four percent of the time, workers die from atmospheric hazards, such as oxygen deficiency. Let's look closer at the 34 percent die from atmospheric hazards. The data shows that more people die acting as a rescuer than being the initial victim. And usually, the rescuer dies from an atmospheric hazard. It is natural for a would-be rescuer to want to act immediately to save someone's life. However, rescue can only be successful if the rescuer is protected from the hazard that affected the person in trouble. Consider an example from British Columbia. A barge was being used to transport gravel. Pardon me. Uh, so the barge was being used to transport gravel, and the gravel was damp and caused the inside of the hull to rust, which used up some of the oxygen in the hold. A worker went in to inspect the vessel and succumbed to the lack of oxygen. Three would-be rescuers also entered and died because they failed to recognize that while the oxygen level near the entrance was okay, the oxygen at the bottom of the hold was below 10%. A fourth would-be rescuer was badly injured when he fell off the access ladder going down into the hold. Fortunately, he was rescued and survived. So you need an effective confined space work and rescue plan in order to protect your workers, comply with the law, be prepared in case an incident occurs, and protect your investment. It's a sound business strategy. We will now dig a little deeper into atmospheric hazards and respiratory protection. Gases and vapors can be flammable, toxic, or simply capable of displacing oxygen and thereby creating an oxygen deficient atmosphere. Some gases are lighter than air, so they rise, and these are more likely found near the top of the confined space. If the entrance is at the top of the space, then they may disperse out of the space when the entrance is opened, putting that worker at risk. Some gases are heavier than air and will accumulate near the floor of the space. This demonstrates why it is important to test the air at the top, the bottom, and intervals in between. This slide demonstrates why continuous monitoring is so important. In this example, the space was considered medium risk, 
So the worker entered with a monitor and EEBD. While working, they encountered a headspace where gas has accumulated. Next, they encounter a depression in the floor where another gas has accumulated. Neither of these would necessarily have been detected if testing were only conducted at the entrance point. The next image suggests that the worker disturbs some sludge along the floor, releasing a contaminant. And at this point, the worker's alarm might go off. They would don their EEBD and escape from the space. We could spend hours going through all of the factors that influence selection of a particular type of respirator. And we will talk about a few of those factors in a moment. But perhaps it is enough for now to summarize by saying that you must consider legislated requirements, knowledge of the hazard, capability of the respirator and the wearer, and the practicality of the respiratory solution. This slide summarizes the types of respirators most commonly used during confined space entry. On the left are examples of air purifying respirators, which use filters and cartridges to capture airborne contaminants. These are used when atmospheric hazards are known, are anticipated to not change significantly, and may be selected for the benefit of being small, lightweight, and simple to use. The images in the middle show an EEBD or emergency escape breathing device. As you can see, it includes a small cylinder of breathing air and a clear plastic hood. These are only suitable for escape from an unknown or toxic environment during an emergency. Using an EEBD would, for example, help address the intent of section 8.1 of CSA Z1006, which addresses unplanned changes in conditions. The pictures on the right illustrate multifunctional respirators and SCBA, which may be worn for a variety of reasons, including minimizing exposure, ensuring regulatory compliance, or simplifying the process of managing exposures. These can be easily implemented using a portable air source, such as an air cart. When considering an air purifying respirator, one consideration is the assigned protection factor, or APF. The APF is the level of respiratory protection that should be provided by a properly functioning respirator used by a properly trained and fit tested worker. The APF enables us to compare the relative levels of protection offered by different styles of respirator. Some respirator styles can be up to a thousand times more protective than others, as indicated by their APF. It is also important to understand that respirators reduce rather than prevent exposure. As an example, half-face respirators, such as the ubiquitous N95, have an APF of 10. This means that if properly worn, the concentration of contaminant inside the face piece will be at least 10 times lower than the concentration outside the face piece. This slide demonstrates the categories of respirators commonly found in Canada. The bottom row illustrates the APF of 10 afforded to filtering face piece respirators like N95s and half face elastomeric respirators. Apologies. You can see that certain loose fitting head tops that look like a hard hat combined with a face shield and used as part of a powered air purifying respirator or PAPR have an APF that is 2.5 times higher than a negative pressure air purifying half face respirator. Moving up the scale, we find full face respirators and PAPRs with hoods or helmets to the products with the highest level of respiratory protection, which include self contained breathing apparatus or SCBA and multifunctional respirators, which are often referred to as pressure demand airline respirators with escape SCBA. 
You will see an image of an EEBD in the lower right corner. It is not shown in a category because it does not have an APF. It is only intended for escape. Now let's take the concept of APF forward. The maximum use concentration, or MUC, is simply calculated by multiplying the occupational exposure limit of a chemical by the APF of the respirator. The MUC indicates the maximum concentration of the chemical that the respirator may be moved, used in. But here's an example of how an MUC is calculated. In this case, we are considering the maximum concentration of ammonia against which a negative pressure half ace respirator may be used. The MUC is calculated by multiplying the APF of 10 times the occupational exposure limit of ammonia, which is 25, to get an MUC of 250. Since this is below the IDLH for ammonia, which is 500, and we can probably use this respirator. But before making a final decision, you would take into consideration that ammonia causes eye irritation. So you would have to wear goggles with this respirator, or you might consider using a full face respirator. Continuing with this example, let's calculate the MUC for a full face respirator, which has been quantitatively fit tested, I should add. In this case, we multiply the APF of 50 by the OEL of 25 and get an MUC of 1,250. However, as noted earlier, the ideal H is 500. Air purifying respirators cannot be used in concentrations at or above the ideal H. Therefore, even though the MUC calculation indicates 1,250, in fact, you could only use the full face respirator in concentrations below 500. In summary, these examples illustrate some of the relationships that exist between the factors that influence respiratory protection selection. Now, if we think about supplied air respirators, this is a decision tree that helps to illustrate selection of EEBDs versus multifunctional respirators versus self-contained breathing apparatus. EEBDs might be selected if your risk assessment indicates the contaminant is not expected to be present at levels that require use of a respirator, and if the escape route takes less than 15 minutes, and yet there is a desire to have an escape respirator just in case something goes wrong. While not a confined space, the ammonia leak that took place at the Fernie BC Arena, which unfortunately resulted in a few deaths, is an example of how an EEBD might have helped workers to escape from a deadly environment that suddenly arose. If the escape route is longer than 15 minutes, then another form of respiratory protection may be required, such as an SCBA. <clears throat> Next, an SCBA might be selected if the exposure is best minimized using a respirator that has an APF of 10,000, or if the exposure has the potential to be ideal H. Typically, SCBA are used in, when task durations are less than the typical cylinder size, so commonly less than an hour. Having said that, it is possible to connect an SCBA to an airline and thereby use it on the airline while working and use the cylinder for entry and egress. There are certainly many configurations available. Finally, a multifunctional respirator might be selected if the task duration is longer than 60 minutes, if the entry point is small, making it difficult to enter with an SCBA, or if the multifunctional respirator is simply preferred because it is smaller and lighter. One thing about multifunctional respirators, yeah, one of the main limitations is that you must be connected to the air at all times when entering. Um, there's all very, very few circumstances in which you can enter a space using the, uh, the air in the cylinder that's worn on the hip. We're nearing the end of the presentation, just a few more points to make. And here are a few deadly mistakes that I'd like to share with you. 
The first is entering a tank without properly testing. There is significant risk entering a confined space without first understanding if hazardous conditions exist. This includes a scenario where you exit the space to go for break and then come back and assume that nothing has happened and enter without testing. Number two, failing to consider the hazards that are created by the work that's being undertaken inside the confined space. For example, welding fumes and gases can build up quickly. Number three, failure of the attendant to remain alert and paying attention. Number four, failure to properly select your instrumentation and then keep it maintained, calibrated, and checked. And five, failure to establish and practice emergency procedures. That's important to, to remember the hierarchy of preferred rescue methods and how that influences your operation and respirator selection. The hierarchy of preference would be first to self-rescue. If the worker gets in trouble, they can get out on their own. Second choice would be to rescue without having the rescuers actually enter the space, such as with a fall arrest and retrieval system. What's less desirable is having the rescue team actually enter that hazardous space to get the worker. And of course, the worst case scenario would be having to do that in an ideal H atmosphere. Selection of EEBDs and multifunctional respirators help to enable a worker to self-rescue. Freem has a wide variety of products and training to help you with all stages of confined space entry, from planning to entry, conducting work, and if necessary, rescue. For assistance, we'd encourage you to please reach out to our customer specialists who will either help you directly or put you in touch with one of our regional respiratory specialists or our application engineering team. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience, and if, if you're looking to ask a question on the, on the presentation, uh, please look to the right-hand side of your screen, and there's a questions tab where you can enter a question. Um, David, the first question we have is the following. Uh, one of the listeners works at a food processing plant where they use spiral freezers, and these have maintenance work conducted on them periodically. Would this be considered a confined space? I would have to have more information about um, about the space itself, the configuration. I think the uh, the best answer is to go back to the definition of confined space and ask yourself, is the area that they have to do maintenance intended for normal human occupancy? And is there potential for a hazard? Okay, yeah, potentially follow up via email from that listener. Uh, a second question is this, is an explosion proof headlight required PPE in a confined space? Um, to your knowledge, has there ever been an explosion triggered by the use of, no of a non-explosion proof lighting? in a confined space? I am not personally aware of an explosion being caused by a headlight, uh, but certainly you have, to be, you have to use equipment that's appropriate for the environment that you're going into. If there's risk of developing a flammable atmosphere, first off, you would exit the atmosphere. Um, you, you're not supposed to work in a confined space if the atmosphere is flammable. Um, but certainly if you were working in a, in a tank or a confined space of some sort where um, those materials might be present, then you would have to use risk management and, and consider whether one was required. Okay. I know that sounds like uh, it depends, but that's always so often the, the case with confined space management is you have to consider all the factors and, and make, make a risk management decision, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, a listener asks, going back to your ammonia example, why would using the full piece not be suitable when the APF is 50? Doesn't that provide 50 times more concentration than the half piece? 
Does that make sense? <clears throat> Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly, could, but let me answer it this way. You could use a half or full face respirator for exposure to ammonia when the concentration is below the ideal age. And assuming that's the only contaminant, you'd have to take whatever else is in the environment into consideration. Um, the full face example, um, we only talked about not using it above the ideal age concentration. But certainly a full face is an excellent way of protecting both respiratory system and eyes uh, from exposure to ammonia. Okay, Th thanks David. Um, another uh, listener asks, if ventilation measures are used in a confined space, it would still be considered a confined space, correct? Correct. Okay. Ventilation is just one of the controls you employ. I cert okay. Certainly, when you look at uh, managing confined space, when you do your assessment, respiratory protection is the last line of defense. Um, you know, you should, I mean, all the regulations and standards and, and just um, good practice in health and safety would require you to first try to eliminate the hazard and then control the hazard using some means like an engineering control, such as ventilation. Okay. We'll ask a few more questions here. Mm -hmm. Do air blowers need to have a low airflow alarm system? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with air blowers. My specialty is in uh, respiratory protection. My apologies. No problem. Okay. Uh, we have we have three more questions at present. Uh, David, do you have any recommendations for training that is more around marine based? confined space entry training? Recommendations. Um, well, I, certainly you need to, um, if you get into marine, then you probably have to start looking into training that includes the uh, consideration of solace. So um, I'm not sure where you're going with that, but certainly there are companies that specialize in the training for shipboard or oil rig type um, operations. Fair enough. All right, we have a, a listener ask this, so I'll, um, I'll try to interpret this. How, how can we test the atmosphere of hidden levels in a confined space without risking any worker injury, especially when it is not expected to contain any depressed or higher levels where gases can be trapped? So I guess the question is, how do you test those areas that are away from the entrance? And uh, that's a fair question. Um, that's why you, you test before you go in, and then you have to consider what's in the space, uh, what's been in the space before, for example, and what's in the space now, what kind of work you're doing. Um, you would, if, if there is the potential for something to be there that you don't know, an unknown contaminant, or if there's a potential for an unknown concentration, then in that case, the standards and good industrial hygiene practice would have you treated as potentially IDLH. Not that it is ideal age, but you have to take that precaution. So in that case, you would enter under something like a, a multifunctional respirator with continuous monitoring. And once you've gone in and you've tested the space, you might be able to determine that in fact, um, the multi multifunctional respirator is not required, but you would want to use that as you go in and do your test. Again, there's a lot of variables that come into play, of course. Sure, okay. David, um, another question. We have a, mm -hmm. a medium risk confined space with a retrieval system. Do we still need a rescue team on site? Do you need a rescue team on site? Okay. I, I, again, it would depend on the nature of the work and the potential for an upset condition to occur. Um, Sure. You're tip, typically what would be required, depending on the level of risk, you either need to have a rescue team that is readily available, or you would have to have a rescue team that is immediately present, and that would be dependent on the level of risk that's involved. Okay. Do you have time for a couple more questions, or they're continuing to roll in? Sure. Okay. So here's one. Are crawl spaces considered confined space? 
uh, um, depends where the crawl space is. Sure. Again, again, go back to the definition of confined space and and um, apply that. Okay. David, uh, another question. I work. Someone says I work for a transport truck company with a full service garage. It has a pit in the shop floor. This is debatable among different staff members, but would a pit be considered a confined space when covered with a trailer that is being serviced? That is a good question. I'll follow up on that one. Okay. All right. I'll ask two more and then um, I'll, I'll allow people to follow up with um, the experts on screen. What kind of things should you consider to help determine if a location used primarily for maintenance, uh, if it is designed for human occupancy? So I'm reading that straight out. I'm sorry, could you say it so, one more time, please? So what kinds of things would, should you consider to help determine if a location used for maintenance is designed for human occupancy? Is that something you can answer? It would be normal. Remember, it sort of refers to normal human occupancy. So, a confined space is a place that a person can go to do work, but not on a regular basis. So, they go in there for a specific task like uh, inspection or, or maintenance. Um, so, if you're talking about a, a place that people go into on a regular basis, not an infrequent basis, then that's potentially a, a site that's been designed for human occupancy. Okay. Uh, our final question is uh, actually one where they're asking you to re-explain uh, something, and that is the multifunction respiratory. Uh, are you able to give more details on, on what you shared in your presentation? Uh, certainly, and again, I can follow up later, or one of our specialists can follow up later, but a multi, if, they're, if you're asking what is a multifunctional respirator, they're more commonly referred to as a pressure demand airline respirator with a SCAPE SCBA. Uh, it's just the CSA standard introduced uh, the, the term uh, when it was rewritten. So uh, it's a, you have to differentiate a multifunctional respirator such as that from simply a pressure demand airline respirator. The, the standard pressure demand airline respirator um, has a lower APF, that is a thousand, and does not include the little cylinder of air that you wear on your hip, um, whereas the multifunctional is a combination of the two. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a hybrid between a full SCBA and um, that pressure demand airline system. Okay. David, thank you. That That's all the questions we have time for. And I'd like to thank everyone who attended today. If your question was not answered, there are three 3M contacts on the screen and you can contact them according to your region for follow-up. Also, if you'd like to watch the presentation again or share it with a colleague, a recording of today's presentation will be sent to the email you registered with uh, in 24 hours. Thank you and have a good day.